Yeah. Okay, I'm getting the nod that uh, folks are here. And again, on behalf of the Vermont State School Nurses Association, I want to welcome all of you here for our fourth town hall of the 2020-2021 school year. And our special guest is Cynthia Kemish. She is school nurse in uh, Zug and Luzerne. If you did not get a chance to join us when she was here uh, on the 28th of May, when she presented to us after the first week of, well, kind of in the middle of their first week back at school, that recording and those FAQs are available at the vssna.org website. So Cynthia, we are so grateful that you are taking this time and uh, willingly sharing with us what's going on, what's happened since we saw you last and um, what you have planned. So I'm just gonna again say thank you so much for giving us your time and go right ahead and fill us in on how things are going. And before I let you do that, please um, stay muted so we can hear. And if we have time at the end, we may address some questions for Cynthia, but remember, She's not gonna be talking to us about what's going on in the United States. It's Europe and she's gonna uh, just remember that we're looking with, with those eyes of this is how it works elsewhere. So thank you again and you are yes, on. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It's um, very kind of you to invite me and I'm, I'm happy to share our experience. Um, we are working our way through uh, towards the reopening of school next week um, and there are different decisions every day that are being made and is, is driving our program and trying to get everybody um, across our school all working as a team and It's safe to send their children to school. So um, I was going to talk a little bit about um, in Europe what's happening. Uh, Europe is going, starting to go through um, uh, a second phase. So we're seeing a rise in numbers after they were dropping down again. We're seeing different countries um, experiencing a rising numbers. There's been a push to try and keep all the countries open in terms of um, travel within the country because uh, it's the countries like Spain and Italy that are um, large vacation countries um, and they're reliant economically on having overseas visitors come in and these really are the countries that we are now seeing rise up and um, some countries are now requiring quarantine if you go and visit one of these countries that when you return you need to go into quarantine for 14 days. So um, it, we are seeing a change um, in Europe again and, um, and in Switzerland as well. So for, for many weeks in Switzerland, we had cases, less than 10 cases across the whole of Switzerland. Um, but yesterday we had 311. So the cases are definitely on the rise. Um, and at the moment that's felt to be uh, caused by the younger people, the 20 to 30 year olds who have um, started to come back together and um, are maybe not so uh, careful with the measurements that they are taking when they join together. We did have a case of a nightclub opening and um, people having to leave their contact details um, and somebody from overseas had gone and had COVID and then they tried to to contact everybody and the contact details that have been left behind were false so whether people were underage and were leaving false information but um, the, the country has had to tighten up um, its uh, expectations of um, their citizens. They do have a COVID app which you can download onto your phone and it will contact you if you have been in um, close proximity to somebody who in the next 14 days um, shows signs of uh, COVID and gets a positive COVID test result. 
and in our country of 8.5 million, about uh, 1.3 have actually downloaded the app at this time. Um, one of the challenges is that uh, if your phone's a bit older, it won't um, work on an older phone. So, so I'm going to um, see if I can get the next slide up. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about Switzerland and, and I can answer a few questions on other European countries if people have specific questions to that. But I think the, the key point is that every country is really following their own path and making their own decisions and there isn't a European wide decision making and I suspect it's a bit like the states where your states are making their own individual decisions and countries within Europe are making their decisions on how they're handling this and moving forward. So um, currently uh, we've had 30, over 37,000 um, cases of COVID within Switzerland, um, uh, 1,718 deaths. Um, there was one death last week, so um, the, the death rate is pretty low at the moment in that there will be a couple of weeks without any deaths and then uh, maybe the odd one or two. We still have no deaths under the age of 30. I hear that's um, even better in Vermont. I think uh, Clayton said it was, uh, oh, I can't remember, under 60. I think you'd have no deaths under the age of 60. Um, our cases per 100,000 um, is 8.7 as of today. And that is rising and um, really isn't a very good number at all to the point that um, Switzerland for the first time for a couple of countries has been put on their quarantine list as of today. So they, if we travel to those countries now, we'll be obliged to uh, do 14 days quarantine. Um, the test rate has been pretty steady throughout. There's no problems in getting tests in Switzerland. And if you do have a test, you normally get the results back within 24 hours. So um, that's, that has really helped, I think, with the control um, controlling part of it um, and of all the tests that are taken about five percent of them are actually positive at this time. So this is a screenshot that I took um, today from the uh, Swiss government website and it just has a little bit of a breakdown of some information um, and uh, the bottom graph here shows the number of cases and you can see that we um, faded away almost to nothing and you can slowly see it starting to pick up um, up until our 311 cases yesterday. Um, I'm going to put my cursor there. This is Zoog, this is where we are and um, as a region we've got very low, low numbers um, but we are surrounded by Canton Zurich, which um, you can see the numbers are higher there. Um, the breakdown is such that uh, more women than men are catching it. And if I go on to the next slide, um, you can see the breakdown here of the um, number of cases on age range. So um, not nine year olds, 337 um, cases. Uh, I think we always have to be a little bit careful that they're probably not testing as many children as they are adults, as children are not experiencing such um, extreme symptoms. Um, but what we do definitely see is a rise in cases between that 10 to 19 year olds and um, upwards and it's this 20 to 39 year olds at the moment that are driving the numbers where we're seeing a particular increase in the numbers at the moment. So we are due to go back to school on um, Tuesday next week um, so we've spent the last two weeks preparing and um, developing different policies and things and um, we have to work within the um, Swiss regulations um, and this is where they stand at the moment. They still feel that children under the age of 14 offer a low risk of spread of um, the disease and um, at the age of 14 and under within the school setting, there is no need to um, social distance. Um, contrary to that, if you're over the age of 12, you have to wear masks if you're on public transport. Um, 
but actually within the school setting, children under 14 don't have to wear masks. Children over the age of 14, um, they recognize that the risk increases and there's an expectation to um, uh, social distance of 1.5 meters. And if you can't do that, then certain cantons are saying you have to wear a mask. And that's what's happened in the canton I'm in, um, that if you cannot maintain social distancing, then you need to wear a mask. And uh, certainly in our high school, um, we don't have the space to uh, have everybody back and maintain that. So our students, our older students will all be coming back with uh, a face masks they have to wear. So as a school, um, uh, the leadership team and the board have sat down and, and again, just trying to start the new year with a focus on where we are, what we're going to be doing and what's the most important thing and um, health, wellness and safety uh, come out again as their main priority. And when we sit and make decisions, um, though, that's the first thing uh, is I know it's hard in a, in a school, in a place where they want to educate and educate and educate. And sometimes um, we just have to say, it can't be as good as it has been in the past because we need to um, make safety and health our priority. We are going to start the school with no option of home learning. Um, the Swiss government have said, if the child was well, well enough to go to school, um, before lockdown, they should be returning to school. So those students, those diabetics that were in school should be coming back to school um, as the new school year starts. We will of course, and we've given our um, parents, we've informed our parents if there is some reason why um, they don't feel it's safe for their child to return to school, um, we will discuss it and uh, I think there will be some home learning. But uh, uh, as a general rule, there's no option. When we went into shutdown last time, parents were able to choose um, 90, about 94, 95% of parents chose to send their children back to school. There were a few that kept them at home. Um, but uh, I think parents are wanting their children to run, return to school, um, obviously with the safety measures put in place. We have um, created a document, a reopening document, which I've put the link in there and you can um, share the slides afterwards so people can access this. This gives us um, a breakdown into our different dis divisions and talks about how we're going to address things across our three divisions, the primary school, the middle school and the high school. Um, uh, so you're very welcome to look at that at another time. So um, before the summer holidays, we had um, a crisis team that was set up um, and it involved uh, quite a lot of members of the leadership team. Um, and as we've returned, um, our aim is to cut this down a bit to a COVID team in order that um, decision making is uh, quicker and that we can come together and um, uh, not so many people involved in taking up their time because they have a school to run. A lot of people have a school to run. So our COVID team is now set up of um, the director, our three division principals, um, a nurse, which is me, um, a communications person to help with uh, sharing information with parents and our director of operations. So one of the decisions that we've made as we've come back um, to school is uh, bubble size. So pre-shutdown, we were um, in bubble sizes that were class-based. So it was a maximum of 20 students mixing. Um, everything that meant that students crossed over at break time or buses or lunch time, was removed and everybody stuck to their bubbles and um, uh, it worked very well, um, but uh, it's obviously hard to run a school if you are trying to keep children in their classrooms. So we, as we go back, the Swiss government have basically said we can run the school as 
um, just open it up and run it as normal. Uh, our challenge is a little bit that as a private school, we're actually quite large compared to the local public Swiss schools. So um, a local primary school in Switzerland may have no more than 100 students and we have 100 students within a grade. So we as a school have increased our bubble sizes to a grade level. Um, so at break time, children will only be able to play with their grade level. Um, they won't be able to, uh, at lunchtime, they eat with their grade levels. So we've opened it up, but not um, freely opened it up all with the idea that if we have a positive case that we can have a little bit of control over the um, contacts that a student may have been in touch with. Uh, we are going to continue with our no parent on campus. This is helped by um, our cantons telling us that we have to do this so that makes it a nice easy rule. Um, we can have parents on campus for a purpose in that so if there was a real concern about a child we and we couldn't have a online meeting then it can be a pre-arranged meeting but in general no parents on campus um, for the time being. Visitors onto the campus so adult visitors we will um, allow and we've classed it for visitors can come on if it's involved in the normal running of the school. So if the photocopier breaks down, then we can get the photocopier um, person in um, to help fix that. And any visitors that actually come into the buildings are required to fill in a visitor form with contact details, which we then keep for 14 days in the event that um, we hear of a positive case within the school so the government can contact them. Uh, again, we're here trying to keep our bubble size and our, our groups separate, things like assemblies. Um, if they do take place, and they're very, I think they're unlikely to at this point, but we talked about them just being in grade levels only. And staff meetings, we're trying to keep staff apart. Um, uh, we want uh, all staff really to social distance and certainly keep within their grade levels as well. So all staff meetings at the moment will be held online. So in Switzerland, social distancing in masks um, are some of the key uh, ways of addressing the issues. Um, and I've put here the breakdown of the requirements um, uh, for students uh, regarding masks. So the younger students, there's no requirement to social distance and there's no requirement to wear masks. In middle school, um, there's no requirement for social distancing. And by the Swiss guidelines, um, masks are not actually required, but we have as a school decided that we would strongly encourage students to wear masks. Um, and certainly all our teachers will be wearing masks. And at the high school, the social distancing is required um, and be, we know we can't manage that, so they will have to wear masks even when they're sitting in the classroom. I know in Germany, they were allowed to, once they were in the classroom sitting, they were allowed to take their masks off, but um, that will only happen if a teacher uh, determines that there is enough distancing between students. Um, as I mentioned before, all staff should social distance or wear a mask. Um, and uh, we have um, today, uh, today we found out that we're, we are actually required to supply the masks to the teachers, which is um, going to be a, a challenge. We worked it out. If we gave everybody two surgical masks um, a day, uh, that we'd need about 2,700 masks for uh, the week. So um, we're trying to work our way around that. Um, we would encourage if teachers want to use uh, material face coverings, um, they can absolutely do that. Um, or my thoughts were that we give each teacher 20 masks and um, the surgical masks and we ask them to change them halfway through the day and then they put them in a paper bag the ones that they've been wearing and then they reuse them a week later so it would be um, sort of quarantine the mask for a week and would be then uh, possible to reuse uh, 
so we're going to we have to see how this goes and how many people want them off it's a challenge to um certainly to our school and a lot of the teachers and the children it's a challenge because the environmental um drive is really to uh, be as uh, eco-friendly as we can and um i think we know that the surgical masks aren't eco-friendly uh, hand washing is another key um, point, certainly promoting um, uh, as the children come back to school and it's regular hand washing throughout the day, hand sanitizers on the entrance to all the buildings. Um, I've, I've been feeling quite strongly, I had a lot of teachers coming in and asking me for hand sanitizers so they can squirt it on the children's hands as they walk into their classrooms and I my I feel concerned about the level of chemicals that we are going to be um, maybe introducing to some of these younger students. And of course, I've said to teachers, if you need it, then you can have the hand sanitizer. But the first priority is if the children can wash their hands, then they should be washing their hands with soap and water. If they spend the next four months um, having doses of hand sanitizer, five, six, seven times a day. I think that's um, a, a bit of a challenge to a three-year-old's uh, physical body and I would be concerned at um, what we're actually putting in. So absolutely use the hand sanitizer if there's no other choice, but first, first priority is hand washing. And we would be expecting our children um, working out roughly about six times a day, they'll be washing their hands whilst they're in school. Ventilation is another really key, um, really, really key point in Switzerland and the government have been um, promoting this quite uh, a lot, that they would like regular ventilations of classrooms throughout the day. And they make a recommendation of having the windows open absolutely wide for about 10 minutes every hour to 90 minutes. Um, or when a class may change. So if you have a, a group of students moving from one class to another, when the next lot of students come in, the, the, there's time given to ventilate the room. We've had to have a look at some ventilation in our school buildings. We have um, a school building that uh, doesn't have windows that you can open. It's a, a built-in ventilation system that the concern was it doesn't work very well because the building is incredibly hot and we've had long ongoing problems with that. Um, we had a ventilation expert in, they said the ventilation is adequate, but we then had teachers that were very concerned because they didn't believe the ventilation expert and they were concerned um, about uh, this issue of not being able to ventilate. Um, so as a school, we have actually purchased um, the Dyson cooling towers, which um, are also class, they talk about purifying air. So they have a HEPA filter in them and they can run whilst the students are in the classroom on a nighttime setting. So there's no um, fan or wind being blown across the room um, and it will uh, uh, support um, purify the air as it says I'm um, there is absolutely no advertising in terms of they don't state anywhere that it removes the um, COVID virus if you look at it the filters are um, capable of uh, removing the virus because of the size but I they haven't done the, the testing on this this was um, definitely done to help our teachers feel safer and a bit cooler when they're in their hot classrooms. And again, we're going to be looking to try and spend as much time outside where and whenever possible. Cleaning, so we had um, upped the cleaning regime within our school previously. We just had cleaners come in at the end of the day, um, but we uh, now have a team of cleaners coming in throughout the day and they are uh, just continually um, cleaning high-touched areas um, and bathrooms and shared spaces. Um, we've asked the teachers to be responsible for the classroom during the day, so they will clean down the tables a couple of times during the day, um, trying to limit the number of adults walking into a classroom and keeping the cleaners out until the end of the day, until um, everybody's gone home. Sickness, um, and this is a, a 
another strong point that the Swiss are really pushing that if you're unwell, you stay at home. Um, one of the changes we have seen is now that the Swiss doctors are saying that if you're symptom free for 24 hours, you can go back into school. Um, I've, we are going to keep it at 48 hours for the time being. Um, I expect as we come back to school that we will see an upsurge in numbers and just general illnesses as people start to share their um, viruses. Um, and so at this time, we are going to keep it 48 hours symptom free um, if you have been unwell. And that's for staff and um, students as well. We will keep, we're not doing um, temperature testing or anything like that as children come into school, but we do ask that children who have been off school um, due to illness, that they come back in the morning via the nurse's office. Um, and we just ask the question, have you taken any medicine today? And we will do a temperature check on those children. Um, I think of about 200 children that we did pre-lockdown I had one child that had turned up with a fever so um, uh, our parent parents were doing really well and responsible I think the child turned up because the child was desperate to come to school and hadn't told their parents that um, they weren't feeling great uh, we have the advantage in Switzerland oh, um, of a screening tool so that if somebody's not feeling well, they can go um, online and they can put in certain information and it will determine whether um, they should see a doctor. And what's quite interesting is that we have seen the, the government has uh, adapted that depending on the situation. So um, as the, I think the ability to uh, test improved and the results were coming back much quicker they upped the number of people that they wanted to see and included children in that so um, it's been quite interesting to see that this isn't a fixed screening tool either the government seemed to be using it to um, uh, be able to pick out cohorts of people that they actually want to screen um, we have stated as a school that if somebody in the family is being tested for COVID, then um, we expect uh, family members not to come to school until the result is known. And that's relatively easy to do if the tests are coming back within 24, 48 hours. If it's taking 14 days for the test results to come back, then that's, that's a completely different challenge there. Um, if we have a positive COVID taste, a test, um, we will inform other members in the class um, and that will come from the health department uh, with the idea that if we tell the parents of those students that have shared the classroom, they will be alert to any signs or symptoms. What we not completely sure yet is because every canton or state is a little bit different is that we have seen um, schools in Switzerland that have gone back and they've had a positive case and they've actually just shut the whole school but on paper that's not um, what they're planning on doing but um, we'll see uh, in reality if that um, actually happens. Um, we have the same requirement for staff so uh, they, if somebody in their household is being tested, they should not come to school either. And there's a link on the document there for uh, our school's illness and fever policy. Uh, one of our requirements by the state is that we have to have an isolation room. Um, we have a health room and we have actually set up a, another small isolation room that's well ventilated and is has minimal stuff in in order that it's easy to clean um, and we have informed our parents that in the event their child is unwell that they should expect that we will put a mask on that child um, as we send them home. We have tried to make a, a criteria that we would expect a child to be picked up within 45 minutes of us making the call. Um, most parents pretty good uh, We'll, we'll see how <laughs> we go. In terms of the health room, um, we've laid out markings on the floor to keep children social distancing and they work incredibly well. Um, they see a yellow line on the floor and they stop at it. 
Um, obviously we're doing some cleaning in between each children and we're really trying to control the number of children arriving in our office and so um, again we will ask the teachers to call us um, if they're going to send a child down to the nurse's office then I might say well I've got someone here can you send them down in five minutes or um, can you keep hold of them or maybe we'll come to the classroom if there's um, a lot of children waiting. Um, obviously if there's an emergency or there's a, uh, an accident and somebody needs immediate treatment they can come that's that's not a problem but it's for the little stuff we're just going to try and control a little bit more and we are again going to give our teachers some very basic first aid supplies with the idea hopefully that they will um, care for and treat the the scrapes and grazes and things that we see a lot of our bus service is going to be up and running so we stopped this um, pre-shutdown um, and uh, because it was a mixing of uh, a lot of children um, we are only going to um, run the bus service if the students are wearing masks because this is the one time that they're not going to be in their class bubbles or grade bubbles um, so there will be a requirement that they wear masks if they're going to use the school bus service um, and we have had um, in our buses you see they're quite small and um, they is a protective screen between the driver and the children um, a lot of our drivers are a bit older um, and there was concern for their well-being so um, the drivers are wearing masks they've got the screen and the children will wear masks as well um, we're reopening our food, food service again and pre-shutdown we did um, uh, bag lunches, I think it, uh, I'd call it a packed lunch, but a bag lunch uh, um, which was delivered to the classrooms. However, we're going to open up our food services. Again, we're going to stagger um, the opportunity to get food by grade. So um, the classes uh, will attend the lunch room by their grade. Um, no self-service to salads and things like that. The uh, catering team will make up pre um, bowls of salad and things so that they can pick up a bowl and uh, no picking out the you know tomatoes and corn and um, sharing of implements. Um, there's been a lot of plexiglass gone up in the uh, serving area around um, where the food is served uh, and um, we will ask all the children to bring their own water bottles so that there isn't sharing of jugs and glasses and things like that. The tables are all going to be laid so there's no putting, no um, sharing or putting hands into cutlery trays and things and all our kitchen staff um, have actually worn masks the whole time and will continue to do so whilst prepping and serving food. In the event of a positive case, um, what we're going to do is uh, we will obviously have to follow the health department's requirements. So this is why I put a question mark there. As I mentioned earlier, we're not sure how they're actually going to behave in our, um, our canton. And it may be that they say the class can keep running or they may say, actually, we want you to shut your whole class down for um, two weeks. We have made a decision as a school that um, some of you may have heard of these uh, apps that you can use asking parents to um, attest that their child is well enough to go to school. Um, and though we don't want to do that every day for our students, we have put in our risk matrix um, that in the event that there is a positive case that we will um, start and use the My MyMedBot app um, as a way of raising profile with parents and keep it to a limited time frame. So we're probably looking at um, uh, two to three week time frame um, until there are no more positive cases. If another positive case comes, then we would expect them to uh, conti continue using it. Um, it's an interesting one. I think um, our parents will really like it. It will certainly, from the optics point of looking at a school, they will feel that we've stepped it up um, in terms of this situation. So um, it might help parents feel uh, encouraged to send their child to school still. 
and in the event that we have a positive case, um, uh, we will drop back into class size bubbles in that grade, I think. Again, it may be all decided for us by the health department and, and that's a little bit of an unknown for us at this time. So other thoughts that are happening in the school, we have um, library services are restarting, but only for the classes going in. So there are extra services that the library do like family, um, book and choose and story time. And they've really gone back to the basics where they will have a class come in, they will do their library lesson and, and have a book choice. Um, and then the library will be, uh, cleaned afterwards and ventilated and then another class can come. Um, the lunchtime browsing for students or after school browsing has stopped at this time with the idea that in four to six weeks um, we'll have a better idea how the numbers are going to react to schools going back and maybe we can then start uh, introducing some more of these services then. Um, at this time, all sports events have um, been cancelled by our sports association, the school sports association. Um, and though within Switzerland, sports clubs have started again, um, uh, the schools at this time have decided they are not going to have um, competitions and they will review that, I think, in November. Um, social events at the school we have um, cancelled, uh, so we're really trying to focus on is the event that we're going to do, is it actually an uh, integral part of the school and for the child's learning and social events as nice as they are and we can run them um, if we social distance and have masks, however we feel that's uh, the, the benefit uh, doesn't outweigh the risk. And so for us at this time, we have canceled social events for the school. Day trips um, are allowed once uh, a risk assessment has been made by a team. So if there is a trip to a museum or something, we would look at that and then decide whether um, we felt again, the benefit, the educational benefit of going, does that outweigh the risk of the extra risk of um, uh, of leaving the campus. Uh, we have said no overnight trips. Um, and the big thing that I have to try and tell to teachers and, and the librarian and people is that it's okay that it doesn't look the same as before. It's um, important that uh, the decision by leadership and the board that health and wellness and safety is our priority. And that should be the driving force for making our decisions. And so it's okay if uh, you're not doing everything that you used to do. That's it. Thank you for listening. Have we got some really challenging questions? <laughs> I'll so, be happy um, to answer any. Cynthia, right now, um, there's not any questions in the chat box, but two things. I, I glanced back through your previous presentation, and when I, um, when I looked at when you were going through this one, I was wondering plexiglass, you had mentioned plexiglass in some areas. Did you use plexiglass as a barrier in any classrooms? Um, so we purchased uh, initially three plexiglass um, freestanding units for teachers to try. Um, and we told the teachers we had them. Um, and we had one kindergarten teacher take one whose daughter um, has some health issues and she wanted it so that she could sit side by side safely with a student and helping them with their reading. Um, so she has one and I have another teacher who picked one up um, from me yesterday who is a breastfeeding a four month old baby and she um, is just trying to put everything in place for her to feel safe. Um, she spoke to her doctor and um, the doctor is happy for her to come to work um, but we're just trying to be supportive and have said that if she feels that she would like the plexiglass then um, we can arrange for that. So she's going to use one next week and decide if she likes it and if she does then we will, she has to go to three different classrooms so we will then buy two more for those classrooms to help her. Yeah. 
Okay, great. So I, I understand that maybe some of the questions were asked um, directly to you in the chat box. So please, uh, you can go ahead and respond to those. Oh, that means I've got to open the chat box. <laughs> there it is. Uh, how do you protect confidentiality if you notify a classroom about the positive case since the child will not be in school for 14 days? Um, so uh, this is taken out of our hands. This is driven by the health department. Um, though we won't necessarily go in and say the name, people will know. Um, and that is something that the health department is uh, happy for to happen in terms of uh, protecting the uh, rest of the community. In our experience, I have to say, we had um, uh, students in the school, when we had parents that were being tested, um, they knew it almost before the school knew it. So um, certainly with the older students, the it spreads like wildfire anyway. So we as a school have um, decided that uh, in the event that we have a positive case, we will um, not only tell the, um, the people within the class, assuming that's what the uh, health department um, says to do, but we will actually tell the whole school and say there has been a case in the high school in grade 11, for example, because the next day it will be in the newspaper. And so um, I, we will address it like that in order to give the parents a choice to decide if they're going to send their children into school the next day. Great, did, um, did anybody else send you um, in a private chat or is that the only one that you had that way? It's the only one. Okay. Uh, so then I, the next thing I made a note about was um, when you presented last time, you talked about hand washing stations and outside. Um, and I'm curious to how that worked and if you're continuing to use that. Uh, yep, and we've upgraded. So before we very quickly put in two long troughs where you could have um, eight children at a time washing their hands outside. Um, and uh, it worked very well. And actually the teachers really liked it. So as they were coming in off the playground, the children would stop and wash their hands before they enter the classroom. And so we have now um, installed over the summer, uh, a very similar thing, but it just looks a lot nicer. Less hose pipes involved than um, <laughs> a bit of plumbing <laughs> has happened. <laughs> Right. Uh, and then, now, how that's going to work in winter, I've no idea, but um, certainly for now, it, it's uh, been a success. That's great. Uh, you had mentioned my MedBot as the app, uh, so um, I know that, and that looks like that's out of um, uh, shoot uh, Luxembourg. Luxembourg, yes. But, um, so, when did you vet that company for confidentiality and make sure that it met the requirements that you needed if you're going to use for folks to report symptom symptomology through the app? Yes, yes. And, and I know they um, uh, meet the US standards as well. So um, when, uh, when we were talking to them, um, we were reassured that they had done everything they needed to. And what I particularly liked was that they... Um, uh, very clearly state that they will not use any of the data. They're, they're not interested in that. It's, it's uh, the data they can give us is for the school, not for um, other purposes. Okay, great. And, and so I just, uh, I typed in um, the link to their website into the chat, just so everybody, if anybody was interested in looking at that. Um, okay. And then um, on the, the final slide of your last presentation, um, you had set up, um, a school nurse group um, yeah. we're doing um, kind of like questions and answers and working through things in our state uh, COVID coordinator. So we're um, most of the districts in our state have a COVID coordinator and they're um, working on a group like that too. Are you still, do you still have that group? And is that still something that's successful for others to use as research? Yep. Yep. So it's, um, uh, it's going strong. I think we have about 800 school nurses on there at the moment. Um, from across Europe, a few from Asia, and um, the majority now actually from America. Uh, I, I think uh, 
it was mentioned on the NS N S A N website or something. So we had a lot of contacts and it's been really helpful. We have um, uh, several Zoom meetings, question and answers. And, and actually we had one about uh, two weeks ago where we came um, and as a group uh, looked at 60 different questions that nurses had posed about what they were doing and spoke about it and then fed it back to the group. So it's been, um, yeah, no, it's been very interesting and I learn something from it every time somebody else goes on there and there's been sharing of a lot of documents, um, quite a lot of the, the sort of COVID return to school plans um, that the US have put together very well, um, uh, has certainly helping some of those nurses that are feeling more isolated and, and trying not to do everything on their own. So does that, um, the link that you had last time still work? Yep. Okay, yeah, so um, you have to contact me. I'm afraid I'm, I'm, I'm the gatekeeper. You just send me an email and I will uh, send you the invitation to it. Okay, so we'll make sure that if anybody uh, requests that, we can get your email address to them. Uh, one, a question that's been posted here is, would you be willing to share your plans for assessment of students with COVID-like symptoms in an isolation space? Um, yep, uh, absolutely. Um, I can send that over uh, maybe to you, Clayton, and you can... Okay. Okay. We 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 are definitely going on the um, premise that uh, if uh, a student is presenting and they feel unwell, they're going home. There's not too much assessment. It's it's really if a child is there standing in front of us saying they don't feel well, then we will send them home. Um, obviously, we will do some some basic checks. We're in a very privileged situation that. Um, the children like coming to school and we don't seem to have children trying to uh, get out of school uh, and in fact it's the opposite problem that they we want to send them home and they don't want to go home so uh, I, I definitely work on the premises if a child comes into me and says that they're not feeling well I believe them they're not feeling well they go home of course there's one or two children that catch me out but <laughs> in general yeah, and certainly at this time. Fabulous. Um, the next question is, um, do you have um, more than one student or staff in your isolation space at a time? Um, no. Uh, so, well, we did once, but they were siblings and the dad was being tested. So we sat the siblings and they didn't actually either have symptoms. Um, but uh, we have enough space so we could use the isolation room and then the health room if needed. Um, to sit children and uh, we can keep two meters away easily and they would be wearing masks. Okay, and, they, and so if um, you said they would have a surgical mask at that point, correct? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's something that we asked parents to inform their children, particularly the younger children, to say that if you don't feel well, this is what's gonna happen, so they knew. Okay, that's great. So you did all that um, pre-planning, explaining how that would look so that there would nobody be surprised. Yeah. Great. Uh, do you have a clear return to um, school protocol for kids um, who you send home symptomatic? Oh, <laughs> that makes it sound like I should. Um, no, uh, basically we tell the parents um, that these children have to be um, symptom-free before they return to school. And then we do the check when they come back into school. So if they come in and say, oh, and the children are so honest. Um, so the parent might say, you know, go to school, don't worry about it, we'll give you some paracetamol or something. Um, they walk into our office and we ask the question and they say, oh yes, I've got a bit of a sore throat and I was coughing last night. We would just send them home. Okay, and so if, but if you did send a student home um, with symptoms, uh, and is there any requirement for uh, them to see their primary care physician or um, get anything to, no, so no testing or anything along those lines there? No, we won't require that. We would uh, strongly encourage the parent to connect with their doctor. Um, we do have this online uh, facility in various different languages that they can um, access, which would then guide them to uh, what they should be doing. So depending on the symptoms, whether they should be contacting their doctor or not. 
Um, we're in the lucky situation that the government has taken on the costs of having a COVID test. So um, that shouldn't be a factor to restrict um, somebody having the test. And actually the fact that they're turning them around without, within 24 hours um, means that people are a lot more willing to do it. Excellent. And, um, and the tests that you're using, um, the accuracy or said that you're feeling good in the accuracy of the test and is it positive and negatives are being um, notified within 24 hours or just the positives? Uh, positive or negative within 24 hours. Um, I have no idea about the accuracy. I have faith in the public health system in Switzerland. Um, there, there really is, uh, I, I take um, some strength in Switzerland is a land of quality and um, that's how they will do things um, and cost doesn't really come into that. So they will be doing uh, a quality test. There's always going to be some false positives and, and, and things within there. But, um, and that's one of the issues for us with the face masks is that in Switzerland, they are still, the federal government is only recommending surgical face masks. Um, because they believe that that is the better quality option, um, which then makes it very difficult to have a comment on uh, face coverings and, and um, when there's no actual guidance from the government with that. Okay. Thank you. The next question, and if I don't um, state this question exactly right, um, Jane, Ann, if you can just send another note. Um, so the question was, how do you monitor bathroom use? And I guess I would add to that is, uh, are you controlling who can be in the hallways at any one time if you already have them in bubbles? Um, and is that a part of the monitoring? Um, so uh, a couple of things um, are the school, the way it's laid out, um, they, they tend to be in grade along a corridor. So now we're having grade bubbles that um, works that the children can mix and go to the bathroom in that in that grade level um, pre lockdown when we were in class um, bubbles uh, the children had um, classrooms were assigned a time when they could go to the bathroom because we have limited number of bathrooms and we were trying to restrict them of course um, that wasn't a hundred percent all of the time. Um, and if a child needs to go to the bathroom, they need to go to the bathroom. Um, the only benefits, uh, the only thing that we could really say is that we had the cleaning was upped and those contact points and things were being, um, cleaned more frequently. Um, I, I absolutely recognize we're not doing everything perfectly a hundred percent of the time. And sometimes it just has to be the best that we can do. Thank you. Um, so what are your protocols around food allergies? If students are eating in their classrooms, do you have peanut free uh, or tree nut free rooms? Yeah, um, actually, can I just go back to the previous question? I want to, um, I was speaking to a nurse from America somewhere and she had said that they had instigated in their school actually last year something called ePass, which was an electronic system set up to allow students to leave classrooms. I hadn't heard of it before, but um, it was one of those things that I thought oh, I should look into, but um, it might be of interest to some of you. Um, protocols around food allergies. Um, so when we were, as a school, we are not a nut-free school. We don't, um, we are a nut-aware school. We don't say to parents that we can promise your child is in a nut-free environment. Um, and so when we went to eating in the classrooms, we re-sent out a letter to all the parents of the children in that class that say had a nut allergy to say, just to remind you, because we do this at the beginning of the year, to say, remind you, there's a child in this classroom with a peanut allergy, we would ask for your help um, in making sure that uh, you don't send your child in, but it's not a promise um, there. The teachers were really good at the cleaning before and after eating. And um, certainly some students, uh, uh, if with certain allergies, 
things were done like um, so they would sit on the outside edge of the table so then they're not surrounded by children with food and the teacher would look in the food boxes of those other students sitting next to them. Um, as we go back we're going to be back into the lunchroom um, and uh, the food served in the lunchroom is all nut free um, but uh, we're going back to our normal um, cleaning between tables and these children sitting at the end of the tables and, and, and things. When um, you go back into the lunchroom, um, will there be any physical distancing requirements at that point or is it going to be back to your normal cafeteria? We, we don't have the requirement to socially distance with um, the students on the campus that I'm on um, and so uh, we are just going to keep them in their grade levels and they will, they will not have to physically distance. But the staff will wear masks, is that correct? The staff will wear masks, okay. yeah. Great. Yeah. At the high school, they will going to have to physically dif distance during the lunchtime because they'll be taking their masks off and they're these, the older cohort. And you were, um, you were speaking in meters and I was trying to do calculations. So I think it's actually two meters and then one and a half, it, or was it one and a half and three? Um, so it used to be two meters um, uh, pre the summer holidays and as we've come back the government has changed and it, it to 1.5 meters. Okay and I threw those calculations into the chat box for folks <laughs> so we could do a little bit um, of math there. Uh, one of the other things and I'm trying not to stir up a hornet's nest with this next question but it, it, it surrounds music um, so uh, singing as well as playing instruments um, and how um, the approaches in Europe or in Switzerland, um, just because we're, we may be doing things differently here, but be curious to see how it's uh, happening for you. So um, in the Swiss music schools, um, they have said you can return back to uh, all instruments depending on the distancing. So if it was a wind instrument, the space around you had to be a larger space than um, the 1.5 meters. So we, as, as a school, we have decided we will not do wind instruments at the moment and we will not do um, choirs uh, or voice classes unless it's a one-on-one -on -one private voice lesson where we know we have enough space and the teacher will can wear a mask and be socially distanced enough. Um, it's really hard because we have our, our music teacher saying, well, what if I go and stand outside with my um, students and we sing outside? But we, uh, again, we've decided a bit like the library, we're going to cut back wait until we can see what's going to be happening it learn maybe from other schools and other experiences and then we can always introduce it in six weeks time if um, there's been uh, further evidence that this is safe to do or there's been no uprising we can in the numbers we feel that we could then uh, re look at it reassess it and then implement it if we felt it was the right time so uh, kind of along with that, I know you talked about sports, but um, for physical education, do you have any, um, I, and I don't remember hearing that, but I might've been doing something in um, one of the other things I was working on. So if you could just address physical education a little bit, that'd be great. So again, um, pre uh, summer holidays, when we first returned back in our class bubbles, um, PE lessons stopped, but what we did do was we had longer break time. So the children had two 45 minute break times a day outside um, in zoned off areas with PE equipment and the PE, PE teachers were out there um, encouraging games, encouraging the use of the equipment and things. So that is what the PE looked like before um, the summer holidays. As we go back, um, we will be going uh, to PE classes uh, in the gym and um, using equipment. The teachers will wipe the equipment down after the use, um, but there's no required, again, no requirement for social distancing uh, in our age children. Um, and at the high school, they will try and keep, uh, do their sports at social distance. There is no requirement to wear masks when you're doing sports. And so uh, that will be um, 
the social distancing is going to be key for those older students. Um, so in essence, our PE program is running back to normal. We've had to make some changes to the gym in order to be able to open the windows and ventilate them really wide. Um, and so some of the timetabling for the classes has changed just a little bit to allow for 10 minutes of ventilation in between groups of students. Great. Um, one, of the, um, one of the things that's come to mind is, uh, do you have any guidance on if you had a, um, an uptick in positivity rate? Um, at what point is there a decision made of, uh, of when you would still, not just in the school, but just in the country or within your canton, um, that, that would drive possible closure again? Um, I don't think, as a country, we will go to full closure again. Um, I think what they will do is if there is an area or a region or a district, they are likely to shut that school or shut that area down. Um, it hasn't happened yet, though we have seen an increase in numbers, say in Geneva, and they haven't done that yet. But I, I don't personally think that this country will go back into full lockdown again. And uh, with that, uh, so travel, um, so within, uh, with, because within Europe, travel is fairly open. So are there any restrictions for folks that do travel when they come back um, before they can come back to school? Yep. Um, there's no restrictions from us as a school, but there are restrictions from the federal government. And we've actually received instruction from them um, that we have to... Uh, um, make sure that our parents know that if they're coming from a certain list of countries and they're required to quarantine, that they actually have to quarantine. Um, we, we have been told it's not our job to um, enforce the rules, but uh, obviously if we hear of a family returning from a, a country and they haven't quarantined, there's an expectation that we would inform the, the local um, health department. Great. It, um, and I, I just happened to scroll back and I'm looking at the, um, the third slide on your presentation and um, it looks like in around, um, I guess, 620 or so, maybe a, a week or two after that, you started the climb again. So do it would, um, and I don't remember if you mentioned this or not, but do you know what was the cause of the increase in positivity? Um, that was, we'd gone into what we call a soft opening. So they started to open things up softly we we were never in what i would say a real hard shutdown like in italy where you was you were confined to your house for um uh 24 hours a day and you're only or 23 hours a day and you're allowed out for an hour but that was when um uh public transport was increased again people was said they could start going back to work um and businesses were opening up again Um, so we don't have any other questions in the uh, chat box. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to look again and see if anybody sent you directly. Um, and I think Soph is back on and I think she was going to make a couple of maybe announcements. Uh, Soph, are you here? Yes, I am. Thank you. Cynthia, thank you again so much. Um, there's some construction going on in my, the road in front of my house. I'm, I'm going to say it was that why I lost my internet access. Um, again, thank you so much. We really appreciate your willingness to come and share with us how things have been going with you and uh, the questions and the concerns that you have had to deal with. Uh, some are similar to, uh, I think that's where all the questions and specific to what about this situation? What about that situation? Um, and the graciousness with which you say you have to keep reminding people that we're doing what we can. Um, Cause I'm getting the sense from, from here, our Vermont nurses that uh, the tensions are rising as we are getting closer to uh, returning to school and feeling like we still have so many unanswered questions. So um, the fact that it's working for you and you're, uh, you're calm about that, means a lot to us. It's very, it's very reassuring. And I'm sure I speak for the whole group here. So again, thank you. 
If there are questions that you want uh, answered, you can send them to um, to us and we'll make sure that we get a response from Cynthia. She's been so gracious about answering our questions. I do want to let you know that next week, our town hall will be on Thursday, but it will be at a different time. We're moving it forward a half an hour because most of us will be back in the school setting with our teachers. Um, that will be with Dr. Holmes. Um, we'll get the most up-to-date information we possibly can uh, with COVID as we're getting ready to open schools. And since I have you all here as a captive audience, I would like to announce that the 2020-2021 Vermont State School Nurse of the Year was notified yesterday morning that um, with some great conspiracy with her superintendent and leadership, so she did not know this was coming. And Louisa Driscoll is our uh, Vermont State School Nurse of the Year. And we are just, it was such an honor for me to be able to be there um, and to surprise you, Louise, that was fun. Your administration and your staff just clearly love you and respect you. And for them to be so excited about, I Louise is here and I know she doesn't have a clue because she's wearing a baseball cap and a sweatshirt. <laughs> so it was fun and your family just, it, it was great. It was great for me to be a part of that. And it's so amazing to, um, to be able to share that with you. So thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me do that. And congratulations are gonna keep coming your way. And for that, we are forever grateful for all you've given to us. Um, so with that, um, we will look forward to seeing you all next week. I know that Clayton will, plan to get this recording and, uh, up ASAP. So look for it and share it. And we will see you next week, Thursday at three o'clock. And that invitation will go out uh, probably Monday. And again, you'll need to register like you've done for this one. So thank you all very much.